Fired up. Bible study. Yeah. All right, boys. All right. No, say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Word up. Tell you the Bible song just hit different when the beat dropped, man. <laughs> like, woo! I'm like the B I B L E. Anyway, word up, word up. Welcome to City Line. We're in week three of a series that we've titled Word Up. And our goal that we that we stated from the outset was simply to help us have a better relationship with Scripture, right? Have a better relationship with the Bible. So if you've been tracking along with us uh, here in the service, if you've been tracking along online via the City Line podcast or just um, from our live feed, we want to thank you. Thank you for, for being on the journey with us. And because we know this. Uh, all of us have maybe different upbringings and different backgrounds and connections with the Bible from our childhood. Sometimes some of us may not have any relationship with the Bible growing up, right? There was no Bible in the home. There was nothing that was familiar about Scripture. And when you got older, you decided to ask some questions about this thing called the Bible, the Word of God. And so you begin to, to lean into it and maybe, maybe you want to discover a little bit more about it. And some of us, we grew up with way too many Bibles in our home. Like everybody and their mama had a Bible. It was like a Bible was holding the table up, keeping it level. There was a Bible like up here somewhere collecting dust. There was grandma's Bible that just sat out and like it was always open to Proverbs 31. You're like, why? Like, I don't understand. But but we're familiar with scripture, right? We're familiar with the Bible. Some of us, we grew up in Sunday school, right? In children's church, listening to that song, right? Not quite like that, but reminiscent enough, right? The B-I-B-L-E, right? We're like, yes. Like, and we would memorize our verses, we'd get our sticker and our candy and we would go about our merry way and and we remembered it and and then we got older and like life happened and then like the b-i-b-l-e just seemed to have lost its impact in our life right and we're, we're still cool with god like we're we're on good terms with him and we're going to church and we engage and worship and we pray occasionally if we've been honest but like scripture reading not really a part of what we do right not really a part of our life it's not really normal for us to engage with scripture and some of us, as we engage with Scripture, we come across things that, that are complicated, that, that seem a little confusing, or maybe that seem a little restrictive or, or, or even primitive, we would say. And so we're like, look, I don't, I don't really understand that. I don't really know what's going on. So instead of asking questions and leaning in, we begin to push back. Say, yeah, I don't really know that I want to deal with that. I don't really know that I want to do that. Right? And we look at Scripture, we look at the Bible, and, and we're looking at our life, and we say, well, I've done pretty well without it really on a regular basis, so why would I need it now? Right? Why would I need to engage with Scripture now? And then regardless of our perception of Scripture, we said we're going to spend the next few weeks leaning in, addressing some things, bringing clarity to other things, and engaging Scripture because the reality is that the Bible, unlike any other book, more so than, than Rowling or Steinbeck or Emerson, the Bible it has the ability to impact and transform our life. Right, the Bible is significant, it's important, it's not just words on the page, it's not something that's static, but it's, it's something that there's more to it than that. There's something about it that's life-giving. Right, the author of Hebrews, he says it this way, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, he says that the word of God is alive and active. The word of God is alive and active. It's not just black ink on a white page. It's not just something there to kind of pass the time or, or something to check off of a list or something to say, well, I read that. Like, like it, it's, it's alive and it's active. It's not another blog, although blogs are good. It's not another book, it's, but, or, though books are good. It's something that's alive and it's active. And if something is alive, that means we can have a relationship with it, right? It's active. It has a purpose. So he says the word of God is alive. It's an invitation to relate with God, and it's active. It's not stale. It's not static. It's not old. It's not antiquated. It's alive, and it's active, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating even to dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. It gets to the core of who we are. It can get past what we pro project and portray to people and get at the heart of who we are. It looks at our thoughts, our attitudes, our motivations, the things that we're about, the things that we spend time in, the things that we go to, and the word of God can penetrate. It can cut and it can challenge us in areas that we may not be comfortable being challenged in. Which is why some of us decide not to engage with it at all, right? We say, eh, I don't really want to be cut deep. I, I like to be comfortable. I like to be, you know, chilling on my cruise ship. And it says if I engage with the word of God, then, like, it's going to get into my heart. It's going to get into the nitty-gritty, and I'm not necessarily comfortable with that. But here's what we have to understand and realize. That scripture, that the Bible, that scripture is one of the best ways to encounter God. 
right? We say, God, I want to hear your voice. God, I want to know your plan for my life. God, I need some direction. God, I need some clarity. And we have available to us the word of God. And he says, I speak to you through my word. I bring clarity to you through my word. I bring purpose to you through my word. Would you just engage it? See, if we're not consistently learning about God and encountering him through the Bible, there's one of two reasons why. It's either access or engagement, right? We either don't have a way to read the Bible or we simply choose not to, right? And if you're here tonight and you say, man, I, actually, I don't have a Bible. I don't have one that I can crack open, that I can read, that I can lean into. I want you to know and right, understand right now, do not leave here tonight without one. Like, come and see me. I, I will get one into your hands so you can go and have scripture. But what I know to be true is that many of us have access to the Bible, Right, many of us have access to the Bible. If it's the Bible app that we've downloaded onto our phone or that we can download for free in the Apple Store or Google Play, like we can, we can get to the Bible. We can do a quick Google search online and type in the Bible and Bible Gateway and BibleHub.com and Bible.com will come up and we can read Scripture. Right, it says the, the average American household has 4.4 Bibles. Like what's a .4 Bible? You know what a .4 Bible is. It's that Bible that's kind of old and, and the binding is all messed up and some pages are gone, right? It's, it was grandma's Bible. It's a little dusty. It's a little funny looking. That's a point for a Bible, right? But you also have four whole Bibles that are perfectly available for you to crack open and read. So we got 4.4 Bibles laying around the house, but we choose to say, I just, I, I don't know if it's important enough for me to crack open. I don't know if, if it's something that I should lean into. So the question is, if our issue is not access, our issue is engagement, the question is why? Right? Why? Why do we not see the significance of Scripture? The things that are too complicated or too convoluted or, or too confusing for us to take some next steps. So what we want to do is provide e each other with some next steps to help us gain some clarity so we can move forward in establishing a better relationship with Scripture. So the question is, how do we take some next steps? How do we begin to build a better relationship with the Bible? And if we're going to get into this, we honestly have to know what we're getting ourselves into. Right? If we're going to get into Scripture, we have to know what we're getting ourselves into. And as you heard in the bumper, and as we've mentioned before, there's so many different translations of the Bible. We're like, where do I begin? Like, where do I start? In fact, there are over 450 English translations of the Bible. That's a lot. Like 450, you're like, which one am I supposed to choose? Like the B-I-B-L-E, but which version is the book for me? Like, I, I have all, I don't know, like, which one should I lean into? Which one should I read? Which one is, is, is going to help me on this journey and not cause more problems, right? We got the KJV, the NKJV, NIV, uh, uh, ESV, ESRV, NSRV, like, all of these different types of Bibles. You're like, I have no idea which one I should read. I have no idea which one is going to help me in this relationship to help me take some real and clear and tangible next steps. So I decided I would help us out a little bit. I would go through a few of these versions, not all 450, ain't nobody got time for that right now, but <laughs> just three, right? You can, can you stomach three of them with me, right? We're going to look at three different versions of Scripture, and I just got to warn you right now, over the next half an hour, you're going to get a lot of information, right? You're going to get a lot of information. It's going to come out hot and ready like a little Caesar's pizza, so I just need you to be patient with me, right? Like, you have your notes, right? so please, like, take that. It's a, it's a tool to help us on this journey together. Right, so take some notes, like engage with that, because we're going to be talking about a lot of things, and it's all significant, and it's all important, and it's better than those $5 pieces. So I was like, which one should I read? Well, I'm going to break down a few of the versions and some pros and cons, because honestly, it comes down to preference. Right, it comes down to preference, like, like writing style. Is it a thought-for-thought -thought translation? Is it a word-for-word -word translation from the original manuscripts? Like, when was it published? Like, who was it written for? Like, what's the audience in mind when they did this translation? And all of those questions, like, are helpful because it says, like, which one should I really choose as I begin to read and engage Scripture? And so first off, we have the King James Version Bible. King James Version Bible. How many of you are familiar with the King James Bible? Right? Thou shalt not, for the Lord thy God is highly exalted, and he will smiteth thee. Like, all of that, right? <laughs> like, all that, that, that language, that prose, we're like, man, like, I remember that, and that turned me completely off. Right? <laughs> Some of us, we like that. Some of us are like, that's a little too complicated. So the King James Version Bible was first published in 1611. It's a long time ago, right? 1611, and it's, it's a literal translation from the original manuscripts that it was working with. Literal translation means it tried to stay word for word as much as it possibly could. 
word for word. The average reading age for those who are engaging with the King James Version Bible is 17 years and older. And here's the thing. The average person reads at about a 7th to 8th grade level. That's not a disrespect. That's not a slight. That's just reality. The average person reads at a 7th to 8th grade level. So if a translation is written for a high school or collegiate level, then it's like that's a little bit more difficult to get into, to really, to really engage with, right? It's like that's not for everybody. That's for some people. And so if we want to we wanna have something that anybody can pick up and begin to read and understand and lean into what God has, um, King James Version may not be the way to go. The, the prose of the King James Version, a beautiful poetic language. It's Shakespearean. Like it's, it's like reading Shakespeare, to which some of us are like, yep, and you can stay right over there with Shakespeare because I didn't do well with that either. <laughs> and others of us, like me, are like, yes, like give that to me. I want to read that. I grew up with the King James Version Bible. I, it has a special place in my heart. Right, the King James Version Bible. Sometimes I speak in King James, but <laughs> right, it's it's language that has influenced many phrases in the modern in modern English and is very close to the original text. But some of the cons is it's, it's archaic in its language, right? It's it's archaic. It's hard to understand. It's stuff that's outdated. It's stuff that doesn't really make any sense as we're looking through it. And some words used in the King James Version Bible have a very different meaning today. Right, you'll see a verse that says, suffer not the little children. You're like, what in the world does that even mean? I don't understand what you're trying to say because we don't use suffer in that same context. We don't use suffer that same way. So you got to go back into your old English and try to think about what is being said and read everything and then piece it all together. So it creates a lot of, of, of obstacles and barriers and, and legwork, which isn't bad, but it's not a good thing either. And then we have the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation was first published in 1996, and I remember when the New Living Translation came out because the church that I was at as a young boy was a King James Version church, and when the New Living came out, it was described as being of the devil because it was new. <laughs> and, and, and it wasn't a literal word-for-word -word translation from the original manuscripts, even though the manuscripts they used were better than the ones that the King James used. We're not going to get into all that. But it was saying, hey, this is new. It's a trick of the enemy to try to get us away from the true word of God, and that's not true at all. Even though it's not a word-for-word -word translation, it's more of a thought-for-thought, -thought, keeping the original idea and communicating that in a way that's digestible, right? It, it doesn't mean that it sacrifices the meaning and the heart of Scripture. It's just a different way of looking at it. In fact, Jesus preaches from the Aramaic Targum often, which is not a word-for-word -word translation of the Torah, of the, 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 the Old Testament. He actually looked at something that was more of a thought-for-thought. Thought. So it's okay if you want to go that way. It's not a bad thing. It's not a complicated thing. It's not something that's, that's sacrificing holiness or anything like that. It's just different, and that's okay. Right? <laughs> it's just different. Right, some of the prose that began as a revision of the Living Bible became a full translation. Uh, it kept the emphasis on accessibility. What that means is it, it, they set out with the intention of having it be read, written in a way that almost anybody can pick it up and read it. Right, almost anybody can pick it up and read it. So it sees, they see the importance of it being accessible to the common person. Because each and every person, nobody should be restricted from access to God's word because they don't understand complicated language. Right? That nobody should be restricted from God's word simply because they didn't go to school long enough or they're not that good at reading or maybe they're learning a second language. You're saying, hey, we want to give something that any and everybody can read and can have access to. And then we have the New International Version. New International Version was first published in 1978 and then updated in 2011. New, new, right? <laughs> like that's that new, new. Uh, <laughs> The average reading age is 12 years old, so it's like the, the average person can engage with the, the, new, the New International Version. They can read that. They can be comfortable getting into that. It's not going to be weird and convoluted and complicated. But see, the, the New International Version is not a word-for-word -word translation or a thought-for-thought -thought translation. It's a happy medium. It's a mix of both. Right? So it's saying as close as they can to the original text, but it's like understanding that certain things just have to be interpret it a little bit rather than translate it directly because we, we live in a different time in a different world and some of the metaphors are just different so it says hey like we're going to help people to understand some of the prose is one of the few translations that tries to balance literal translation with an emphasis on meaning it's often clear and easy to read and it's tried to keep an emphasis on literary beauty making it a good translation for reading in church i don't know if you know this but 90 percent of the time that we're reading scripture here at city line church we're reading it from the niv Right, the NIV is a good, it's a solid choice to say, I want to engage scripture. I don't want to have to answer a bunch of weird questions. I don't want to have to get through all the these and thous. I want something that's accessible, that's digestible, that's relatable, that I can really sink my teeth into. And the new international version is a good version to go with. 
So, now that we've settled on a version of the good book, I have to let you guys in on a little secret. The Bible's not really a book as we, as we think, right? It's not a book like we tend to think about. We tend to think about a book, right, like, like an author sat down over the course of a, a, a short period of time and, and pinned this thing together, got it published, got it edited, and sent it in, and then it ends up on the New York Times bestseller list or on Amazon for a penny. Like, <laughs> right, we think of books like that. It's like, like, a, like a singular author sat down and they wrote this thing and they had an intention and it's one particular form of literature, one genre, and the Bible's not that at all. In fact, if you're following along in your notes, this is your first fill in. The Bible is not a singular book. It's an anthology. It's comprised of many books, letters, poems, and works of literature that tell us a single story, that tell us the story of God's plan of redemption. Right, there's many different works of literature within the Bible. We get poetry, we get songs, we get wisdom literature, we have letters, we have biography, we have history. All of these different things, these rich you know, forms of literature are found in the Bible that we have and is put together. And in fact, the Bible was written over nearly 1,500 years by 40 different authors. So no one person sat down to write. These are all kinds of different people from different walks of life, from different societal um, uh, statuses. And they say, hey, we're going to write something that's inspired by God. It's not written down by God, but it's inspired by God. And it tells us the story of God's redemptive plan, God's plan to redeem his creation and humanity. And it's a story that has four main parts. Clap if you're still with me. All right. We can keep moving. Okay, four main parts. There's four main parts of the story. It's creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. It's a creation. We see this in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, right? God created the earth. He created the heavens and the earth. He created all the animals. He created humanity, and he saw that it was good. And everything was peaceful. Everything was harmonious. Everything was, was so connected. Everything was beautiful. Humanity enjoyed an unhindered and an unbothered relationship with the Father. Everything was so good. Everything was so well. The, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people would call this shalom. It's the peace of God. It's a peace that surpasses understanding. It's a peace that reverberates throughout all creation. It's wholeness. Everything is harmonious. It's beautiful. It's perfection. This is what we see in Genesis as God is creating. He creates this world and everything is so good. But then if we know the story, we know what happens next. We know what happens next. You see, because God desires a love relationship with his creation. And the thing about love is that love it necessitates choice. Right? You have to choose in a love relationship. Otherwise, it's not love. Right? You have to be able to choose. And if you're able to choose the person, you're able to choose something other than the person as well. And so we see Adam and Eve, and they, they decide to choose something other than God's will, other than God's best for their life. And we have this event that's known as the fall. As they, as they break the relationship with God, as they choose something other than, and they create this distance, sin begins to infect and impact the world, and it creates this distance between God and humanity. And we can look back at Adam and Eve and point the finger at them, but the reality is, us right now, knowing how everything plays out, we still choose something other than God. We still make that choice. We still fall. Paul, as he's writing to the church in Rome, he says, we have all sinned and fallen short. Right? We've all sinned and fallen short, but here's the beauty about the God that we serve is that while we were still sinners, God decided to redeem us. While we were still sinners, he paid the price to correct that relationship and bring us back into shalom so that we can begin to walk with him in relationship with him again. Right, All of scripture before him is leading up to this moment, this point on the cross where God in the flesh, he comes down and he hangs on the cross and he gives his life to restore relationship with his creation and he dies and he resurrects on the third day to offer hope of something better that is and is to come. Right, He says, I'm going to redeem them. I'm going to buy them back and then I'm going to continue my plan of restoration. He didn't see fit to stop at redemption. He said, no, I'm going to redeem them. Then I'm going to shine them up real nice, and I'm going to restore them, and I'm going to move them forward. 
It's like if we see a piece of furniture on the street and we, we kind of like the, 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 the craftsmanship of it, but it's tattered and it's beat up and it's worn out. It's seen better days. It'll tell the story of kids and pets and, and all kinds of things. And we see it and we're like, man, that looks rough, but I like it. I see what it can become. So we purchase it. We bring it into our home and we don't leave it jacked up and dirty and busted. Like we decide to go through a process of renovation, right, of restoration. We sand it down and we polish it up and we reupholster it. And then it's a brand new beautiful chair, but it's still the chair that it was. Now it has a new life. And see what Jesus says is that, hey, I've come to give you new life. I've come to restore you. I didn't leave you just jacked up and busted and tore up from the flow up. I said, no, my creation is going to become redeemed and restored and renewed. This restoration. God decides to move us forward. And like, why is this important? Well, it's important to know where we land in the story as we're engaging scripture. Right? It's important to know where we are in the story as we plot the course, as we're journeying through the word of God. We need to know, are we reading about creation? Are we reading about the fall? Are we reading about redemption? Are we reading about something that falls in restoration? Because if we engage with Leviticus under the assumption that it's talking about redemption and rest, or that it's talking about restoration, that it comes after Christ, we might run into some issues and some problems. Right, we're like, that seems a little prim- primitive. That seems a little restrictive. That seems a little tough. That seems a little hard. That doesn't make any sense. Why would they say something like that? But if we understand that this is part of God's redemptive process and he was moving humanity forward towards what he was going to do in Christ and he was understanding that the way the world was, those people who received those words that are written in Leviticus, they wouldn't have seen it as restrictive. They wouldn't have seen it as oppressive. They would have seen it as liberty. They would have seen it as freedom. They would have seen it as progressive. And so we can celebrate the fact that God is willing to be patient with us, to offer us some next steps. He doesn't expect a quantum leap into something new. He says, no, I want to take you along the journey. Don't miss it. Just come, walk with me, and I'm going to continue to bring you towards something greater that I have for you. We got to know where we are in the story in order to help make sense of it. And so God's word can come alive. It can come alive. See, the story is broken down, it has four main parts, and it's broken down into two testaments, the Old and the New. And a lot of times people have the assumption that the God that's revealed in the Old Testament is somehow different than the God that we see in the New Testament, and that couldn't be any further from the truth. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same gracious and merciful and compassionate and loving God that he was then, that he was in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and he still is today. That is who he is. He does not change. One author says it this way, the Old Testament, it lays the foundation for the coming Messiah who would sacrifice himself for the sin of the world. And the New Testament records the ministry of that Messiah, the person of Jesus Christ. And then it looks back on what he did and how we are to respond. Both Testaments reveal the same holy, merciful, and righteous God. In both Testaments, God reveals himself to us and shows us how we are to come to him through faith. In both, we see an invitation to come to him. In both, we see his grace and his compassion and his love. So it's important that we know where we are in the story because knowing where we are in the story helps provide context to what we're reading. It helps to provide us with some context because context is key. And anything that we do, we understand that context is key. Right? You ever had somebody tell a story that you're involved in and they start telling it wrong? And the way that they're telling it is going to lead people to some unhealthy conclusions about you or what you did and what you said. So you're like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me tell this story because you're messing it up. Right? You're going to get people the wrong idea about what happened. You got to let them know, like, the tone and, like, the when and, like, the why I said that and what happened two years ago that led to this point. Like, we got to provide some context, y'all. We can't just go and, like, tell a single story as if it just happened as an isolated incident. No, like, there's things that happened around this. Right? We understand that providing context is important. It's also important as we engage with Scripture, right? And there's all types of different contexts that, that, we, we, that we need to understand as we're engaging with Scripture, right? There's historical context, which focuses on the original author and the original audience. And then we have cultural context, the original circumstances and the culture of the time in which the book was written. Right? It's, it wasn't written in our culture. It was written to people of a different culture that had different expectations and different practices and different norms and different ways of speaking than we do. So if we respect that and understand that, then we can begin to understand what is being communicated and how we can get life from it. 
And we have the continuing context, which we touched on a little bit when we talk about creation, fall, redemption, and restoration, Old and New Testament. What's the overarching theme of Scripture? How do we better understand that so we can understand exactly where we are and where we are going? And then there's literary context. There's more than that, but we're going to focus for our next few moments together on literary context. And I got to warn you, I'm a nerd. (laughs) Like, I like this a lot, like a lot, a lot. Like, I get excited about this, so just bear with me. It's something that's excited. I think it's it's important to understand and to know because we begin to understand this with God's word. As I say, it, it continues to be alive to us. See, the biggest pitfall, if you're following along in your notes and not understanding literary context, is that people often tend to twist scripture into meaning whatever they want, right? You can divorce something from context and you can add whatever you want into it because it's, it's, I'm going to just pull that out right there and this is what it means. Like, you've seen this before. You've seen basketball players or football players, they say, oh, yo, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And they think he's talking about God letting them pull off a 360 dunk and that's not what Paul was saying at all, God ain't interested in helping you score touchdowns. He's helping you. He, he's interested in helping you live a life that pleases him. Right? He, 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 like, yes, you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you, but you need to understand what Paul was saying. Paul is in prison with nothing, and he is suffering. He says, hey, no matter what, I trust in God because it is God that gives me the strength to go through it. It's not some, some self-help book or some self-help quote. No, it's a, it's a statement about trusting in a God that is true, a God that is good, and a God that is with you even in your lowest moment. I can go through anything because God gives me strength. That's what Paul is saying. So if we divorce it from context, we can start to twist it into meaning whatever it is that we want, when in fact it has deeper meaning than we could ever imagine if we just understand it in context. Right, literary context, it begins with acknowledging the genre of the text that we're reading. A- acknowledging the genre of the text. As we said before, the Bible has a bunch of different types of genres within it. And genres are just the types of literature found in the Bible. Right? It's, it's, it's a book comprised of many books and many types of literature. And so there's so many different types of literature found in the Bible. And they'll be on the screen as you're following along. And I'll try to give a little bit of clarity to each one of them as we move through. And the first is this, historical narrative. Right, there's historical narrative. Narrative is a literary form characterized by time, action. It has plot, setting, and characters. Right? It's a story form of literature. These are real things that happen to real people, and, and they're laying these things out, and they're detailing these things. And we see this form of literature in the Bible through books like Exodus. Right? We see this epic tale of God's redemptive work as he is freeing his people from Egypt. And this happened to real people at a real time, and they see God, a real God, acting on their behalf to move them forward and move them into something greater. We see that. Right, we see the stories of Ruth. We see the story of Esther. These are narrative. We see the story of David's life. Right? We have 1 Kings, 2 Kings, Chronicles. And even in the New Testament, we have the book of Acts, right, which is a narrative. It's a theological narrative about the church right, and, and how she began her mission to live out the purpose that God has placed in the church. And we see that lined out in Scripture. And then we have law. When we engage with the law, we tend to read in our own assumptions and our own perceptions about law when, in fact, they wouldn't have thought of the law as as anything restrictive at all. They saw the law as an invitation to live a God-honoring life, right? They they were grateful for the law. This is why David says, I delight myself in your law. Like, I don't know how many of us here actually delight in law, but David delights in law because he understood that, that he served a God that didn't leave it up to guesswork as how to please him. Right? He didn't say, well, you got to figure it out. Like, yeah, I'm your God, you're my, you're my people, but I'm not going to tell you how to please me at all. Right? <laughs> you just got to kind of figure that out on your own. Right? <laughs> Is anything wrong? Nope, I'm okay. Like, <laughs> that's not the God that we serve. He invites us into a relationship with him, and he, he details it to them how to live a life that pleases him, how to live into the purpose that he has given them with the law. And it's important to know that the New Testament shifts from being a law-obedient people to being a people that respond in loving and trusting obedience to Jesus Christ. And then we have prophecy. Everybody's like, ooh, prophesy. Like, like it, look, I need you to understand something of prophecy. It's not future-telling, right? A small part of prophecy is, is this predictive thing, but most of prophecy is proclamation. It's a declaration to the people of God that God still loves them even in their junk, and it's to call them back to faithfulness in their relationship with God. He said, come back to relationship with God. You have broken the heart of God. You are still his people. He wants you to be back in relationship with him, but quite frankly, you got to get it together. 
right? Quite frankly, you need, to, you need to get it together, all right? We see Elijah, we see Ezekiel, we see Jeremiah, these prophets that are calling the people of Israel back into a faithful and committed relationship with God. And then we have wisdom literature, right? Proverbs, even, even James in the New Testament is written reminiscent of the wisdom literature that, that would, we would see in the Old Testament. These books provide practical theology for living a day-to-day godly life in a complicated world. Then we have poetry, right? We have the psalms, these, these songs like, that are written, these, 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 these expressive things, these metaphors, these books that convey real thoughts and events and emotions, but figuratively. Right? It's important to understand that this is figurative language. These things aren't like actually happening the way they're written, but they're real truths and they're real things, but just expressed figuratively. And then we have gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these stories that are drawn from personal experiences and encounters with Jesus that point to who he is, that point to what he has done, the message he came to proclaim, his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Right, and we have letters, like these epistles, like 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Philemon, these letters that are written in the New Testament to churches, and they're occasional and situational, which means they weren't just written for no good reason. They were actually responding to circumstances and situations that were happening in churches. People that Paul or the, le- the, letters, uh, the writer of the letters, they had a relationship with these churches and with these people. And so they decided to, to write to them, to respond to them over some things to provide clarity, to provide instruction, to, to challenge them to take some next steps. They weren't written to us, but we have them by the grace of God and we can, we can lean into that and we can learn and glean from them. And then we have Apocalypse. Like, oh, that's the cool one, right? Yeah, like <laughs> we have Apocalypse books like Revelation and parts of Daniel. And understand this about apocalyptic literature. It's an intensified version of prophecy, right? So it's still calling people back to faithfulness to God. It's still calling people back into a relationship with God. It's still encouraging the people that are going through a hard time, but with a heavy emphasis on imagery. So it's like sci-fi to the 10th power. It's like ramped it up a notch just to, to kind of help you get it, right? It's not something that's meant to be weird or to decode or, or to have you scratching your head and, and like shaking in your bed at night when the sky gets a little too red. Like it's not what it's about. Like it, it's just calling us back to faithfulness to God, helping us to understand who he is. They just use a lot of images, which is cool. I like picture books. So you're like, why does any of this matter? Like, well, I, that's, like, that's a lot of information. That's all cool, but why is it important? How does this help me as I'm, I'm trying to read the Bible? I'll tell you how. You've ever been online on Facebook, and you see, like, your, your Aunt Edith or, like, <laughs> like, Grandma, like, share an article from The Onion, and they think it's real? <laughs> Right? Or you got these people that get fired up about something they read on Babylon B, and they think, like, it's really going down like that. It's really happening. And then we got to do something about this. Did you read that article on Babylon B? And I'm like, look, Aunt Edith, I, I love you, but that's satire. What? It ain't real. Like, it's just a joke. <laughs> like, it's just, it's just a joke. It's not real. It's poking fun at society. It's, it's not a real thing. And, hey, if you're here tonight, and, and you've been doing that, you've been, like, sharing indiscriminately, like, the onion and Babylon Bee. I just want to let you know we still love you, and you don't have to do that anymore. Like, <laughs> like, Jesus wants to set you free tonight. Like, you can move forward into some new freedom right now. You don't have to do that. But it's important to understand, to identify, like, this isn't real. Like, to, to understand the rules because each genre has different rules, right? Like, ladies. Remember getting that poem from like a crush in middle school or high school and they write you a letter and they say, I will cross a thousand oceans for you. You don't say, prove it. <laughs> Let me see it right now. <laughs> All thousand of them. Because we got a figurative language. Like the, the expectation isn't to actually cross a thousand oceans. It's an expression like real emotion using like similes and metaphors. Like we know that this is, isn't real. So we understand the genre, we understand what we're reading, and and we understand the rules of the genre so we can better glean from it so we don't arrive at some wrong conclusions. I remember when I was a kid, I was six, seven years old, and I was obsessed with, like, alien invasions and alien encounters. It was something that was fascinating to me, but I was also scared of aliens. And so I had a cousin, my older cousin. He was like, look, you can talk to aliens. I was like, how? But don't do it. He's like, if you take a flashlight and you click it into the sky in Morse code, like, it'll send that light beam all the way out into space. I believe this, too. Don't, don't make fun of me. Like, <laughs> and 
and the alien will see it, and they'll get your message, and, and they might just respond. I was like, cool, again, don't do it. And he did it. And I'm like, why? <laughs> like, why would you do that? Like, why? like, you just opened the door, man. You opened Pandora's box, ain't no going back. And then here's the thing, this, is the, like, this isn't even funny. Like, I was scared. Because, like, two days later, like, a satellite exploded that was in our, like, like atmosphere. And it left a trail of space dust. And it looked extraterrestrial in nature. And so I see this in the sky at the my side playing. And I'm like, oh, oh, no. <laughs> no. Why? I told you, you play too much. <laughs> it's a rap. Like... <laughs> So I'm thinking, like, these aliens are coming. Like, I'm terrified. So I run into the house, and I tell my mom, I was like, Mama, Mama, look. Look at the sky. The aliens are here. And she opens up. She looks. She goes, yup. <laughs> <laughs> and so I start to panic. And I was like, I got, I got to do something. About it. I got to go. I, got, I, can't, I can't stick around here. And, like, they come in for me. Like, I had the flashlight. I click, click, click. Like, it, <laughs> this is all bad. And so my mom gets the bright idea to go and hit the breaker box and turn all the power off. So I'm chilling, freaking out. Lights go off. I'm like, oh, man, they hit us with the EMP. Like, <laughs> we're done. Like, so I'm panicking. I'm panicking. I'm panicking. And then she turns the lights back on. I'm like, okay, this is cool. She's like, Troy, come here. Look at the news. So I'm going to look at TV. And there's this dude on there. And he kind of looks like the guy from Read the Rainbow, but he has a visor. <laughs> and I'm like, they done snatched up LeVar Burton's body. <laughs> And then there's another guy with the horns on his head and, like, a wrinkly forehead. And I was like, no, no. Like, I panic, and I run, and I fall down, and I just stayed on the ground, freaking out. And my mom starts laughing hysterically because it wasn't the news at all. It was Star Trek. <laughs> Next generation. <laughs> I thought it was the – understand when I say this. <laughs> When we, read, when we read something with the wrong assumptions, when we, write, when, we, when we watch something with the wrong assumptions, we draw some very bad conclusions, right? So when we engage scripture, it's important to know what we're getting ourselves into so we don't draw some very bad and unhealthy conclusions. Like little Troy thinking he was invaded by body snatching aliens. So <laughs> I'm not that gullible anymore, so don't try anything. Anyway. <laughs> Like, it's important to know that. Like, why we don't watch Star Wars and think that it really happened in the galaxy far, far away. Along. Like, we know that that didn't happen because it's sci-fi. We understand that. And so as we begin to, to respect the genre, to understand what genre of literature that we're reading, like, it can help us to better engage Scripture. And then as we do that, we can begin to ask questions like who, what, where, when, and why of the text instead of just skimming through it and reading through it and making assumptions. Or we can begin to look for words or, or, or phrases that repeat, things that stand out, something that jumps off the page, and any themes that we notice in Scripture. And because we're tracking through the Gospel of John with our, with our Bible reading plan, we, we, we notice that John, he likes to play with the idea of light and dark. Right? He uses a lot of light and dark as he's writing. People coming to him at night. Things are happening in the day. There's light. There's darkness that can't comprehend the light. And he, he's using this theme and he's weaving it throughout his gospel. And we're like, man, that's fascinating. That's interesting. I wonder why. Or right, we begin to ask those questions and, and begin to dig deeper into the text. Because if you picked up a book or read a letter or got an email or a text message from somebody, you wouldn't just pluck something out from the middle of it without understanding the entirety, without like, like understanding the person who sent it and the way that they speak and, and how they are and your relationship right now. And you read that, right, and, 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 and draw some conclusions about it. No, you want to read it in its entirety. Uh, you, you ever got a text message from somebody? And it's like you get text message number three, then one, then two, and it's like all out of order. And then you get the first one, like the first one you get has a phrase, and you're like, what? I can't believe they would say that. Oh, oh, they're quoting. It's a tip from a T. Okay, I see. All right, we're good. Like, right, you ever have that? Like, like you read something, it's like, man, it's completely out of context. This is why it's not good to just pluck something out of thin air and say, man, I'm, this is it right here. Like, it's cool to have memory verses. That's a good thing. Right? It's good to commit scripture to memory. But, but as we dig deeper into scripture, building a better relationship, it's important to read it in context. So the question is, how do we put this all together? Right, how do we actually put this all together? It's a lot of information, but how does it actually help us as we read and engage with scripture? 
And I want to give us a practical tool that will help us take some next steps in our scripture reading time as we're engaging with scripture through our reading plan or through our own devotions. And hopefully this is helpful to you. And if you're already doing something like this, that's cool. Like you, you can come to Harder Read Your Bible class a little bit later and, and get some more tools. But like honestly, studying scripture can be as simple as applying some soap. Look at your word, then back to me, then back to your word. No, like it can be as simple as applying some soap. And soap, it's an acronym, right? It's an acronym. And by using this study tool, we can begin to see scripture more than just reading it and skimming through it. So if we take some time to do this, to put this into practice, you can see that the Bible begins to come alive. And so soap, I said it's an acronym. And the S in soap, it stands for scripture. Right? We acknowledge the genre. We acknowledge where we are in the story. We begin to understand context and then what we do is we write it out, right? And writing it out, it helps us to slow down, to slow down a little bit, to, to begin to hear and to listen and to respond. So we physically write it out. And then we go into observation. The O in SOAP stands for observation. Ask questions of the text. What do you see? What, what, what are we actually reading? Who's the audience? Is there something that stands out to us? Is there a theme that we see? And then application. The A stands for application. This is when God's word becomes personal. What is God saying to me? Are there some next steps I can take? Is there something in me that I need, that, that I need to confess to God, that I need to lay down? Is there an area in my life that's unsurrendered? And then we pray. Or we pray and thank God for his word. We pray if he's revealed something, like we pray about that. We confess that to him, and we ask him to help us take some next steps. It's simple, S-O-A-P. One of my favorite verses to do this with is John 11.35, right? John 11.35 is a fascinating verse. It has a distinction in the King James Version of being touted as the shortest verse in the entire Bible. And it's simply this, Jesus wept, right? And we see those words on the page, Jesus wept. And we're like, that's interesting, that's fascinating, that's a cool little verse. And, and we're like, okay, and then we move on. But what if it was more than just a cool little verse? What if it was more than just a little novelty item, Right? What if God was communicating something to us? And we see Jesus wept. When we engage with this verse, we, 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 we realize that it's in the gospel of John. John was somebody who walked with Jesus, who knew Jesus, was one of his followers, and he decided to, to write about the life of Jesus. And he said there was so much that Jesus did that all the books in the world couldn't contain it, but he saw fit to put this in there. And so we say, why? Why was this important enough to John to write down, to record, to, to let people know about the character and the person of Jesus that he wept? And then we can ask the, the very obvious question. Why is Jesus crying? Right? Why is he crying? What has happened? And so we begin to, to look at what came before 1135 and what comes after. We begin to see the story unfold about Jesus and his friends and the death of Lazarus. So we see the story about Lazarus's death in John chapter 11. In verse 17, it says this. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know even now that God will give you whatever you ask. And so we see this scripture. Jesus wept in John eleven thirty five, 35. And we begin to understand that, that why is Jesus crying? Because a dear friend of his has died. Lazarus is dead. But as we read the story, it becomes interesting. It's like, okay, this is kind of a fascinating story because Lazarus was sick and Jesus was only two miles away. And they sent word to him that Lazarus was sick. And Jesus was like, okay, like, I, I, I'll get to that. I, I can take care of that. And he continues doing what he's doing. And as time goes by, Lazarus goes from bad to worse and he passes away. And then he says, like, when Jesus finally gets there, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. But Jesus was just down the street. Jesus was only two miles away. That's not, it doesn't take that long to walk two miles to do what you got to do and then go back to whatever you were doing. So Jesus was right down the street. Lazarus dies. People had already come to visit Mary and Martha. People had been there to comfort them. And Jesus still hasn't shown up for four days. He hasn't shown up. 
me like I thought this was their friend. I thought this was somebody that was close to them. This is the Lord. Like, he could have taken care of all of it. And as he gets there, as he's on his way, they hear it. And, and Martha goes to meet him. But Mary, she says, you know what? I'm going to just stay back. I don't know why Mary decides to stay back. She could have been busy with everybody that came over. She could have been a little frustrated that Jesus took so long and now her brother's dead. It could have been too hard for her to face him because she had some very real emotions and some things that she wanted to say to Jesus because, hey, bro, like, this is my brother. You could have took care of this, right? And when they tell Jesus what happened, that Lazarus is dead, he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. And Martha's like, well, I know that at the end of all things, like, you'll bring him back, but right now, like, he's dead. Like, my brother is dead. And so Jesus, he tells Martha that he's the resurrection and the life to let her know what he is about to do. He says, no, no, I don't think you understand. I am the resurrection and the life. Lazarus may be in the tomb, but stick with me. In just a few moments, he's going to walk out. But before that, as Jesus goes, they take him to Lazarus' tomb. He sees the dead body of his friend, and Jesus wept. In that moment, he weeps. Why would Jesus weep? See, this begins to reveal to us the heart of God. We don't serve a God that simply sits up there, hears our prayers, and go poof, 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 it's all fixed. Or we serve a God that is with us in the mess, that is with us in the heartache, that is with us in the struggle, that when we cry, he comes and sits right next to us, and he weeps, and he wraps us in, our, in his arms, and he says, let's just cry it out. It's okay to not be okay. Right, this is a Jesus that lets us know that even though he's on the way to fix it, even though he's got the solution in hand, even though he's going to work it out, he doesn't dismiss our grief and our pain. In fact, he, he leans into it and he gets right in there with us. Jesus wept right before he raised Lazarus from the dead. Right, and we see Martha, she goes to Jesus. She says, man, like if you'd been here, my brother, he wouldn't have died. Right, she's frustrated about the situation, but I love what she does. She doesn't talk to all the people that are at, the, at, at, the, at her place, all the people that came to comfort her and say, man, I can't believe Jesus. I can't believe he didn't come here. I can't believe he took so long. He's only two miles away. When she heard that Jesus was coming, she went straight to the person she had issue with, straight to the person that could fix it, straight to the person she needed to get things right with. And she said, Jesus, like if you had been here, she brought it to him. It's okay to be frustrated, but it's not okay to go to everybody and their mama. Like God says, hey, bring that to me. I I got you. I got you. So she goes to Jesus, and then I love what she says after that. She says, but even still, like, I know that God can still give you whatever you ask. I know that I, I still trust you with the outcome. I still trust you with whatever is going to happen. Such a fascinating story. And we say, man, when we observe all of these things, but how does that apply to me? Maybe we're praying and asking God for something. And he's taking too long, right? And we see him working on other people's behalf, and he's like, man, he's not that far. Like, he's close. Like, they're right here. Like, they're getting everything that they need from God, and I'm still struggling, and I'm still asking, and I'm still waiting, and I'm still wanting, and God hasn't come through. Maybe our situation has gone from bad to worse, and, and we're a little shaky in our trust, and we're a little frustrated with God. He's saying, it's okay to not be okay, but would you please bring that to me? Let's talk about it. I can, I'll let you know that I still got you. I still love you. I still work it out. The situation is still in my hands if you would trust me with it. Maybe we just need to come alongside people and be a comfort in a time of need. Right? Maybe we just need to, to cry with some people. Maybe we have a hard time being compassionate and being empathetic, and maybe God is saying, hey, would you be like me? Would you be a little more like me to your friends that are going through something? You don't have to have a word to say or a, or a solve to the situation when they're mourning. It's okay to just sit and cry with them. Maybe that's what God is challenging us with. I don't know what it is, but as we engage and we read scripture, we see these things, and, and whenever God is speaking to us, we can say, okay, God, search my heart. God, search me and, and, and expose those areas in me that are not aligned with you, and please help me to take some next steps in that. And so we pray that, and we thank God for his love and his compassion. We pray that we can learn to trust him and know him more. Because the reality is that we don't read scripture to gain more knowledge. Or we're not reading scripture just to amass knowledge, to become information hogs, to beat everybody in Bible trivia. We read scripture, we engage scripture to get to know Jesus. 
This is why we're doing this thing. This is why this is all important to us. This is why understanding context, this is why all the talk about manuscript, this is why it's important because we engage scripture to get to know Jesus. All of this is to help us to discover who Jesus is so we can continue to follow him. See, Jesus tells the Pharisees in John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40, he says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But what you don't understand is these are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. He has given us an invitation to engage in a life-giving relationship with him through his word. Through his word. These are the scriptures that testify about him. It's how we get to know him. It's how we get engaged in a relationship with him. That's the why. And he's the who behind the what we do. It's all pointing back to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, God. We thank you that you have given us your word, that you have, that you have engaged in a relationship with us, God, that you didn't leave it up to guesswork as how can we live a life that pleases you. Rather, you invite us into a life-giving relationship with you. You invite us to hear your voice. You invite us to know your plans for us through Scripture, God. God, and I pray that as we engage with Scripture, I pray that as we read and as we study, God, that your Scripture will be alive in us. Like, it will be alive and powerful. It will be active in our life, God. That it, would, that it would penetrate to the core of who we are, God, and help us to live a life that pleases you. Help us to take some real and tangible next steps as we are growing with you, God. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy and your compassion. And we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.